part one of the introduction to amateur astronomy lecture series is entitled our place among the infinities so you might wonder in a lecture series about amateur astronomy how come we're starting off with a tour of the universe and there's a good reason why and let me tell you the story behind this this goes back roughly 20 years to one of my club's public observing sessions at the Kalamazoo Nature Center, is we had a guest there who brought a very nice telescope, a Mead 12 inch classic LX200 Schmidt Cassegrain telescope. Really nice telescope, right? And um, there was one point in the night when he got his telescope set up and he slewed to M8, Messier 8, which is the Lagoon Nebula. And he looked through the eyepiece. He had a, a friend look through the eyepiece and his friend asked him, what am I looking at? And the guy with this $4,000 telescope said, I don't know. So that really bugged me as an educator. So for me, in my humble opinion, I think every amateur astronomer should have at least a fundamental background in the science of astronomy, as well as the hobby of astronomy. So that's the point of making this part one of the introduction to amateur astronomy lecture series. On a dark, clear summer night, far away from city lights with no moon, you can see the Milky Way. So here we have uh, the heart of our galaxy, the Milky Way, roughly in this direction here, uh, 28,000 light years away is the very center of our home galaxy, the Milky Way. So of course, this is what the Milky Way galaxy looks like from the inside, but it looks very different when seen from above. But this is what the Milky Way looks like through a time exposure. But from a very dark site, it looks a lot like this, but just not with the color. And don't feel bad if you've never seen the Milky Way. About one third of all people globally cannot see the Milky Way. And this includes about 80% of all Americans. Because, of course, most of us live near big cities where the light washes out the Milky Way. So we really can't get a sense that we live in a galaxy. So again, this is what the galaxy looks like from the inside. What if we could travel far above the plane of the galaxy? And this is what it would look like. So this is not just some random artistic picture. This is based on actual data. So what we do is we use, you know, uh, spiral tracers, stuff like emission nebulae, bright young open clusters and associations of stars, as well as information from infrared and radio telescopes to create this very realistic map of what the Milky Way galaxy should look like from far above the plane. So we live again approximately 28,000 light years from the galactic center in what is known as the Orion Spur or the Orion Cygnus Arm or the Orion Cygnus Spur. It doesn't really have an official name. So you'll see a variety of names out there. So this is the sun's location in the Milky Way galaxy. So we are not in the center of the galaxy, which is a good thing because there's a big black hole there, uh, but we're safely out here in the suburbs. So this is where we find the sun. So of course the sun is the nearest star to earth and it is the very center of the solar system. To find the next star, you would have to travel 4.2 light years in the direction of Proxima Centauri, which is the name of the nearest star. So it does take the sun about 240 million years to complete one orbit about the galactic center. And in the sun's four and a half billion year lifetime, it's done it about uh, 20 times. And you'll see uh, the length of the day varies there because at the equator, it rotates at about a rate of 25 days. But as you get near the poles, it's closer to 34 days. That's because the sun, like all stars, are just really big balls of plasma. So, you know, a plasma is a very hot electrically charged gas, and that's basically what a star is. So they're not solid objects, so they rotate faster at the center than they do toward the poles. 
and the sun is immense. It would take 109 Earths to cross the sun's diameter and 1.3 million Earths to fill its volume. And you can see the sun has an immense mass there compared to Earth, nearly 330,000 times the mass of Earth. But here's a much more impressive fact, I think, is the sun is 99 0.86% the mass of the solar system. So the sun is the solar system. Everything else is bits of leftover debris from the formation of the solar system four and a half billion years ago. And so deep down in the, in the center of the sun, in the core, it's at a temperature of 15 million Kelvin or about 27 million degrees Fahrenheit. And you got to be at that temperature for stars like the sun to uh, convert hydrogen into helium. So the sun converts 4 million tons of hydrogen into helium every second just to generate enough energy to balance the force of its own gravity. So here's the sun through a uh, visible filter, a very nice, safe solar filter that goes over the front of your telescope. We'll talk more about those in future installments. So here we see what's called the photosphere of the sun, which is the visible surface of the sun. When you see the sun, say, setting on the horizon, or you view it with a proper filter, it's the photosphere that you're looking at. So the photosphere is at a temperature of about 5,800 Kelvin or roughly 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And you can see the photosphere has what's called granulation. Granulation is basically the surface effect of convection, basically rising hot gas and sinking cool gas uh, just below the photosphere in a region called the convection zone where the gas or plasma circulates. And you can also see occasionally there's these dark features on the surface of the sun called sunspots. So sunspots are darker because they're cooler. So Again, the surface of the sun is at 5,800 Kelvin, while sunspots are at about 4,200 Kelvin, which is still 7,200 degrees Fahrenheit. So sunspots are still pretty hot, uh, but because they're over 1,000 Kelvin cooler, they look fairly dark. But if you could pluck one away from the sun and place it into the nighttime sky of Earth, it would look like a bright orange uh, star, really as bright as the full moon. So basically, sunspots are storms of magnetism. So again, below the photosphere, you have rising and sinking gas currents. So rising and sinking gas currents can twist themselves into magnetic fields into these rope-like tubes, which tend to float upward. And where these magnetic tubes burst through the sun's surface, that's where sunspot pairs occur. So these magnetic fields inhibit convection beneath the photosphere in the convection zone. And that's where we have sunspots. And again, these sunspots occur with 11-year cycles on average. So every 11 years, we get a sunspot maximum. And then roughly uh, 11 years or six years or so after that, we'll have a sunspot minimum. So here's a view of the sun at a different wavelength called the hydrogen alpha. This is a visible wavelength, but it's at a very specific wavelength of 656.28 nanometers, or if you really want, 6,562.8 angstroms. <laughs> and uh, so this view of the sun at hydrogen alpha shows us a layer above the photosphere called the chromosphere. Now, normally, you can only see the chromosphere during a total solar eclipse, but even then, most of it is blocked. But you can see the entire chromosphere every clear day with a hydrogen alpha filter over the front of your telescope and also the back, but that's we'll talk about that later. So you can again see sunspots on the chromosphere, but they're always a little obscured because, again, they're in a layer below on the photosphere. But in the chromosphere, you can see features like filaments and prominences. But we named these features before we understood they were the same thing. So let's put it this way. A prominence is a filament on the side of the sun. A filament is a prominence on the face of the sun. And just like sunspots, all prominences 
are caused by the sun's magnetism. So here we see a magnetic field, which is looped in shape, rising above the surface, bringing some of that charged gas, some of that plasma along with it. So this is an amazing time-lapse video from the Solar Dynamics Observatory, and we see a monster prominence that it caught in the act here. And you can see other prominences as well. And you also see kind of these little jets all over the uh, chromosphere called specules. And those are related to the um, granulation below. So moving away from the sun, we find the solar system. The first four planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, are known as the terrestrial planets, meaning they're Earth-like, which more specifically means they have similar characteristics. So with the terrestrial planets, they have, relatively speaking, of course, small diameters, large average density because they're composed of rock and metal. They have craters and old surfaces, and they orbit relatively close together inside the asteroid belt. So with most terrestrial planets, as far as we know anyway, they have a solid core of uh, iron and nickel. They have a liquid core of iron, nickel, and rock. They have uh, thick mantles of dense rock and relatively thin crust. But in the Earth's case, it's a very thin crust. So with our first terrestrial planet, We'll look at Mercury, which is, of course, the planet closest to the sun. And it used to have a pretty impressive year of just 88 days. That used to be pretty amazing. But of course, now we know of planets around other stars that go around their stars much faster because they are much closer. And Mercury does rotate on its axis, but very slowly at about you know, a little over 58 days. So between the rapid revolution of 88 days and the uh, slow rotation of 58 58 days, uh, a day on Mercury is really twice as long as its year. And we see its diameter is, is the smallest of the eight major planets. Um, and, and it's uh, just 5.5% uh, the mass of Earth. So during the long Mercurian day, it can get up to 800 degrees Fahrenheit. But because Mercury doesn't really have an atmosphere, during the long night, it plummets to about 290 degrees Fahrenheit. It is the second densest of the planets, just behind Earth, uh, and its high density for its small size tells us that it's mostly metallic. In fact, we now know that 70% of Mercury's volume is iron and nickel. So Mercury is a metallic planet with a relatively thin, rocky crust. And as you can see from this image, where the colors are exaggerated a little bit, uh, Mercury is heavily impacted because it does have one of the oldest surfaces in the solar system. It has no mechanisms to erase these craters, no wind or rain or plate tectonics. And the largest crater is called Caloris Basin. This crater is about 960 miles in diameter, and it formed about 3.85 billion years ago during what was known as the heavy bombardment period when the young planets were sweeping up leftover bits of de debris from their formation. Now, again, Mercury looks a lot like the moon. It is kind of grayish, but a little brownish, really. Um, has lots of craters, but one unusual feature, pretty much unique to Mercury, is this type of feature here called a lobate scarp. So these formed when Mercury's mantle and core cooled, shrinking the planet up and making it wrinkle up. So Messenger uh, revealed that Mercury's radius shrunk up to seven kilometers over the past four and a half billion years. So in a way, Mercury is the incredible shrinking planet. And these lobate scarps here are evidence of that. So this image here covers about 150 miles, and this crater here, for uh, perspective, is about 26 miles across. So some of these scarps can get really, really large. Our next destination is Venus, which has often been called Earth's twin. Now, if that's true, um, if Earth and Venus are twins, Venus is kind of the ugly one compared to Earth because it may look beautiful and bright in the sky, but it's kind of a nasty place. So we see something very odd here is that the length of its year 
is about 225 days, while the length of the uh, day is 243 days. So yes, the day is longer than the year. And it gets even weirder, is all planets, except for Venus and Uranus, as viewed from the North Celestial Pole, rotate on their axes counterclockwise, but not Venus. Venus rotates on its axis clockwise. So we think a planet with a dense atmosphere like Venus, uh, along with solar tidal forces, have gradually slowed its rotation to where it eventually stopped and started rotating backwards. So basically, Venus's dense atmosphere acted like a break on the surface. And so Venus is very Earth-like in terms of its mass and diameter. They are very comparable to Earth. But again, the uh, atmosphere is very different. So you can see here the atmosphere is uh, over 96% carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas. And um, then there is a little bit of nitrogen as well. But before we had spectroscopes, we thought the clouds of Venus were made of the same thing our clouds are made of, which of course is water vapor. So we assumed, you know, a long time ago that maybe Venus was kind of a warm tropical jungle type environment or like a rainforest. There could be, you know, who knows, dinosaurs down there. But of course, reality turned out to be far different because those clouds on Venus are composed of sulfuric acid, hydrochloric acid, and hydrofluoric acid. The clouds of Venus are basically like battery acid. So in reality, we now know this is what Venus looks like. These are taken with Venera probes that were launched um, by the Soviet Union back in the uh, 1970s and 80s. So we knew this before the Venera probes, thanks to the wonders of spectroscopy, but we now know the surface of Venus is incredibly hot. It's 880 degrees Fahrenheit, the hottest surface of any planet in the solar system. And the atmosphere is 50 times denser than Earth with an atmospheric pressure 90 times what we have here at sea level. And so what you see here is, again, is rocks. And these rocks are basaltic, which is typical of volcanism. So it's such a high atmospheric pressure and a high temperature. What kind of probe could withstand those conditions? Here's what the Venera probes look like. So this is a mock-up of Venera 13, um, the, which is on display here in uh, Moscow. And basically, they were withstand, uh, built to withstand the intense pressure and temperature. But even so, they only worked for about 45 minutes or so, which is still pretty impressive. And basically, this probe went into this orange uh, um, sphere here, and they put this atop of a big rocket and launched it toward Venus. But obviously, landers like this can only see a tiny portion of the surface. So the most successful missions have been from orbit with radar. So back in the early 1990s, NASA launched the Magellan spacecraft that used radar to map 98% of the surface down to a resolution of 100 meters. So this is what Venus would look like if we could strip away the clouds. Of course, it would really look gray the color is based on uh, the sunlight filtering through the nasty uh, clouds as the Venera probes uh, saw. So the, the color here is artificial. And it does have two highland regions called Ishtar Terra in the north and Aphrodite Terra in the south. But of course, there's no obvious continents or anything like that. Some models uh, suggest that Venus should, ha should have had a lot of water, but we've never found any direct evidence of that. So Venus does have lots of volcanoes. It has uh, 167 volcanoes over 100 kilometers or 60 miles across. And they're not very high in elevation, but they're very wide. So that's why we call them pancake domes. So here are some of the pancake domes in Alpha Regia, one of the uh, uh, lower regions on Venus. So their average diameter is about 16 miles across, and their average height is about 2,400 or 2,500 feet. Now, whether or not these volcanoes are active is still an active area of debate, because Venus is like a perpetual Michigan, which means it's always covered in clouds. 
So here is our home planet. And of course, astronomy is the study of anything beyond Earth. So we're not going to spend too much time here. But we all know some of the basic facts of the Earth here. Like it's about, you know, 93 million miles or about 8.3 light seconds from the sun. And we all know the length of the year, the length of the day. And Earth, though, is the largest solid object that we can at least you know, see in the solar system. So uh, Earth is the largest in diameter for a solid object, and it's also the most dense. And we do see its atmospheric composition here, but it does contain carbon dioxide like Venus, but instead of 96% carbon dioxide, where Venus suffers from a runaway greenhouse effect, Earth has 0.039% carbon dioxide. So you just need a little bit of a greenhouse gas to uh, make our surface livable. We don't want to add too much more greenhouse gases. Otherwise, that would be bad. We don't want to mimic Venus. We don't want a mini, Ven mini Venus here on Earth. And of course, what makes Earth unique besides the life is that 70% of its surface is covered in water. And of course, here in Michigan, we know that very well because Michigan is the Great Lakes state. So if you're wondering where I am, of course, this is alive. I'm like under this little cloud right here. So here I am. <laughs> this is roughly where I am right here in southwest Michigan. So there I am. Of course, Earth's nearest celestial neighbor is the moon. And you'll see the moon is about, you know, one point, what, Gosh, what is it? 1.2, 1.3 light seconds away, or roughly 239,000 miles. And you'll see the uh, length of its rotation and the length of its revolution about Earth are exactly the same. Now, I've gotten into arguments with lots of people that says, well, this means that the moon doesn't rotate on its axis. It does rotate on its axis but its rotation and its revolution are the same because the moon is gravitationally tidally locked to, to have one face toward Earth all the time. I mean, if it didn't rotate, the moon would look very different during every total solar eclipse, but the moon pretty much looks the same during every total solar eclipse. So that means it does rotate. It just rotates to keep one face toward the Earth all the time. So, of course, uh, the north and south hemispheres of the moon, at least the half that face Earth, are very different. In the north, we have the lunar lowlands, where we have the Maria. So, Maria, which is the plural, or mare for singular, means uh, sea in Latin. Before the invention of the telescope, we thought these uh, dark areas were, in fact, seas like we have on Earth. So they still have that name, like Oceanus po Posolarum, which is the ocean of storms. We have uh, uh, Mare Humorum, which is the sea of moisture. We have here uh, the sea of clouds. We have here the sea of showers and so on. Well, of course, I had to do, of course, the sea of serenity because... Uh, oh no, 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 I have to do, of course, the Sea of Tranquility, because this is where the Apollo 11 astronauts landed back in 1969, somewhere around here. And of course, the moon does have its fair share of craters. The ones you can view with at least binoculars include uh, the prominent Tycho crater in the south and the lunar highlands, where it's much brighter. We have uh, Copernicus, Kepler, and Plato, which has been filled in with lava. And of course, uh, these are vast, flat volcanic plains, and they were created by impacts uh, billions of years ago. But the most special thing about the moon is that we've been there. Of course, it's been a long time. Uh, so here's Buzz Aldrin during the Apollo 11 mission over 50 years ago. And of course, we went back five more times, but we haven't been back in now nearly 50 years. And uh, hopefully we'll go back again, and this time to stay. We'll build like a moon base, maybe some cool radio telescopes on the moon and stuff like that. So there's a lot to look forward to in the future. Moving on here, we'll go to the famed red planet, Mars. So now we are moving away from Earth. And Mars, even though it's only half the size of Earth, is really the most 
Earth-like planet um, in the solar system. It might not be similar in size and mass, but it has many Earth-like characteristics. In a way, though, Mars is a hybrid between Earth and the Moon. Parts of it are very Earth-like, but parts of it are very Moon-like, too. So we do... We do see it has roughly a 24 hour day. And that's one of the things very early observers uh, in the 16th, late 16th and 17th century were able to observe with uh, telescopes because Mars is the planet, uh, the nearest planet whose surface we can actually see. Venus is always covered in clouds. Mercury is always too close to the sun to get a good look at it. So yeah, Mars does have mostly a carbon dioxide atmosphere, but it's less than 1% as dense as Earth. So there's not really, you know, any significant greenhouse effect on Mars. It can get pretty cold uh, even during the day. So Mars is a planet of geologic wonders. It has this massive valley called Valles Marineris or Mariner Valley, which is named after the Mariner 9 spacecraft that orbited Mars starting in 1971. And it's still in orbit today, but of course does not function anymore. <laughs> and um, it's about 2,500 miles long, stretching 19% of the way around the planet. It's four miles at its deepest and 120 miles miles at its widest. So it's 10 times longer, five times deeper, and 20 times wider than the Grand Canyon. This is the true Grand Canyon of the solar system. And nearby, you can see some of Mars's impressive volcanoes called the Tharsis Montes. So here we have Escratius Mons, Pavanus Mons and Eurasia Mons. And of course, here we have none other than Olympus Mons, the largest volcano in the solar system. It's about three, time, three, three times the height of Mount Everest at about 16 miles high and 10 times the volume. If you turn this thing just right, you know, position it just right, it would fit within the entire state of Arizona. So it's big. And of course, we've explored Mars more than any other planet, except for Earth, of course. We've had, we have and had many orbiters and many landers and, of course, many rovers. So here's Curiosity, uh, which landed in August of 2012. And of course, it's been since joined by Perseverance uh, er, er, about this time last year, back in uh, 2020. And this is Curiosity back in 2018, just before the global dust storm that ruined the opposition that year. I'm still trying to get over that. <laughs> so Mars does have two moons, Phobos and Deimos, which mean fear and panic. And generally, they're considered... Uh, uh, captured asteroids from the nearby asteroid belt. You know, that makes perfect sense, right? But there's a lot more evidence to suggest they're um, really chunks of Mars that have been broken off through large impacts. And they are shown to scale in this image here. So uh, uh, Phobos is over seven times the mass of Deimos, and Phobos orbits about 3,700 miles above the surface. Uh, th this distance here is measured from center to center, but Phobos is 3,700 miles above the surface. It's closer to its parent planet than any other satellite in the solar system. And so we do think within 50 million years, Phobos will either crash into Mars or form a planetary ring. And it gets about six feet closer per century. So who knows? So again, beyond Mars, is the asteroid belt. And this image, which of course is just a graphic, looks pretty scary. But of course, to even see the asteroids in this perspective, you have to greatly exaggerate their size. So if you are standing on an asteroid in the main asteroid belt between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, you would have a hard time spotting another asteroid around you. Because on average, they are about 600,000 miles apart. And um, most are very tiny, 42% the mass of the asteroid belt, which overall is only a 20th the mass of the moon. 42% um, of all this is just four objects, one series, 
two Pallas, three Juno, and four Vesta. So yeah, most asteroids are very small and very spread out in this region. Every spacecraft we've ever flown through the asteroid belt has never come close to one unless we purposely steered it in that direction. So it's pretty safe. It's not like the Empire Strikes Back. And we do have, of course, uh, the Trojans. We have, of course, the main Trojans here and the Greeks and the Hildas. These are another group of asteroids in these uh, gravitational pockets uh, formed by Jupiter. So yeah, Jupiter rules over the Trojans and the main asteroid belt. So of course, the largest uh, member of the asteroid belt is Ceres. It's given the totally lame designation of a dwarf planet. Uh, but what it really is, is a protoplanet. Because unlike most asteroids, which are pieces of planetesimals or protoplanets, Ceres is differentiated. Most asteroids are just pieces of other objects like this broken apart. But Ceres really is kind of a mini terrestrial planet with a rocky core and a large uh, mantle of ice. In fact, its uh, mantle is 100 kilometers thick, which means it contains upwards of 200 million cubic kilometers of water. That's more fresh water than what we have here on Earth. And it does have these bright spots, but it turns out uh, it's not ice, it's just salt because uh, much of the water is a little salty. So when some of this wa water uh, sprays out into space, it leaves the salt behind. So, yep, those bright spots were just salt. And uh, given the scale here, uh, Ceres is about the size of Texas. So there you go. So here's a Ceres and Vesta and some of the other asteroids that we visited, but this list is no longer complete here to scale. So again, most asteroids are very tiny. Vesta is also a protoplanet because it is differentiated, but its entire southern region was blasted away uh, millions of years ago in a large impact. So it has like one big crater here in the south. So beyond the asteroid belt, we enter the realm of the gas giants. Uh, so we used to consider the gas giants uh, to all be Jovian planets. So we considered, you know, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune Jovian planets at one time or another. But as you can see here now, we now really consider uh, Jupiter and Saturn to be Jovian planets, while Uranus and Neptune are now known as ice giants. So in general, Jovian planets and kind of ice giants have large diameters, relatively speaking. They are low in density because they're mostly hydrogen and helium. They orbit beyond the asteroid belt and they're much further spread apart and they have multiple satellites. So with Jupiter and Saturn, they may have a molten core, but we're not really sure Jupiter does anymore. It may have been uh, distributed within the interior here, but they do have um, uh, lots of hydrogen. And because of their immense mass, this hydrogen is squeezed toward the center to where it's a liquid metallic hydrogen. And then above the liquid metallic hydrogen is a sea of liquid hydrogen. And both Uranus and Neptune do not contain liquid metallic hydrogen or liquid hydrogen. So instead, Uranus and Neptune have a large mantle of ice, but quote, ice. It's really more of a fluid uh, under great pressure that's electrically charged. So it's not ice in the modern sense. You know, you can't like, you know, ice skate on the mantles of Uranus and Neptune. You know, you can't, you can't do that. So we really do have three types of planets in the solar system. And of course, the largest of all the planets, terrestrial, Jovian, or ice giant, is mighty Jupiter, which is five times the distance that Earth is from the sun, taking 12 years nearly to complete one orbit. But it may kind of revolve around the sun slowly, but it has the shortest day of all the planets at just under 10 hours. And yeah, Jupiter is big. You would need approximately 10 Earths to cross its uh, diameter and a thousand to fill its volume. And as I've calculated many times with many students over the years, um, it's roughly 318 times the mass of Earth. But again, here's an even more impressive fact. 
Jupiter is more massive than all the other planets, all the moons, all the asteroids and comets combined. So Jupiter is really the major planet in the solar system. And yep, as of today, it has 80 known moons, but um, 64 of those moons are less than 10 kilometers or 6.2 miles in diameter. Jupiter does have a pretty impressive atmosphere. This image here is a uh, time-lapse video created by the Cassini spacecraft over 24 Jupiter rotations, so 24 Jupiter days, uh, between October 31st and November 9th, 2000. And here we see Jupiter's belts and zones. So the zones, kind of the creamy white stripes, those are regions of high pressure where the gas is rising. The belts, the orange stripes, are uh, regions of low pressure where the gas is sinking. So just like Earth has high and low pressure systems, Jupiter has high and low pressure systems. But instead of kind of cyclonic circulations on Jupiter because of its uh, heat from the interior, which is twice as much as it receives from the sun, and because of its fast rotation, the high and low pressure systems are stretched out into these bands around the planet that run parallel to the equator. So of course, the most impressive feature in Jupiter's atmosphere is the great red spot, but it's not as great as it used to be. When I was a kid back, you know, maybe in the late seventies, the great red spot was three times the size of earth. Today, it's just a little over um, the size of earth. So it has gotten smaller over the years. And people often compare the Great Red Spot to a hurricane, but it's really a anti-hurricane or really an anti-cyclone because it's a region of high pressure, not a region of low pressure. And so um, you can see it slowly rotate here in this movie from uh, the Juno spacecraft currently in orbit around Jupiter. And it takes about six days to complete one rotation. Now, if you've ever observed Jupiter through a telescope, you've no doubt noticed the four prominent moons that orbit Jupiter, known as the Galilean moons of Jupiter. But this is not a view through an amateur telescope because from Earth, we can never view Jupiter as like a first quarter phase like this. So again, this is with the Juno spacecraft. And occasionally you can see some of the moons vanish as they move into Jupiter's shadow. So yeah, there are the four major moons of Jupiter called the Galilean moons of Jupiter. And they are none other than Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto in order from closest to farthest from Jupiter. You can remember the order by saying I, eat green caterpillars. <laughs> so I got that from Jack Horkheimer, you know, many, many years ago when he was, of course, still alive. So I eat green caterpillars. And you can remember the order of the four Galilean moons from closest to farthest. So they were discovered by Galileo in January of 1610. But the names come from uh, the German astronomer Simon Marius. He, he gave them their names that we use today. So each of these moons has their own unique characteristics. Io is the most volcanically active object in the solar system. Europa is covered in a thick icy crust with a subsurface ocean, most likely. There's a great deal of evidence to support that. Ganymede is the largest moon in the solar system with this interesting groove terrain. Callisto is the third largest moon and is one of the most heavily impacted objects in the solar system. So I would love to spend time here, but again, we still got a lot of ground to cover. So let's move on. Now we go to the crown jewel of the solar system, Saturn. So now we're about 10 times the distance that Earth is from the sun. And Saturn takes nearly 29 and a half years to complete one orbit about the sun. It has a similar rotation to Jupiter, just a little bit slower, but it's only 95 uh, times the mass of Earth, you know, only. So Saturn is less than a third the mass of mighty Jupiter, which is why you can add up all the planets and they still wouldn't equal uh, the mass of Jupiter. 
Now you'll notice that Saturn does show faint evidence of a belt zone structure. But because we're twice the distance that Jupiter is from the sun, it's a lot colder out here. Saturn doesn't give off as much heat as Jupiter. So the belts and zones occur deeper in Saturn's colder atmosphere under a layer of methane haze, or basically methane fog. Saturn is the least dense object in the solar system. It's only about 0.7 uh, grams per cubic centimeter or 0.7 uh, the density of water. So if you could find a planet lar or a body of water large enough, Saturn would float in it. But that would be one pretty impressive ocean. And one thing you might not notice, but you can kind of get a sense of in the image here, is that Saturn is the most oblate of the planets. So between its rapid rotation and its low density, it's really bulgy at the equator and really flat at the poles. So of, of all the planets, it is the least round. Or in other words, its oblateness means its equatorial diameter exceeds its polar diameter. So this shows us that Saturn is mostly a liquid. But of course, when you view Saturn through a telescope, people really don't pay attention to the planet. They're looking at the rings. So yes, the rings of Saturn are one of the marvels of the solar system. And they may have only um, formed recently, as I'll explain here shortly. But this view is from, again, the Cassini spacecraft. We cannot see Saturn like this from Earth because it's a superior planet, which means it's farther from the sun than us. So we always see like a full or gibbous Saturn, never a crescent Saturn like this. So the width of the main rings is about 43,000, 44,000 miles. Yet they're only about 12 and a half miles thick. So they're very broad, but very thin, you know, kind of like uh, spiral galaxies. And again, as I mentioned, the rings may have been produced within the last 100,000 years, which is a neat idea because that means we live at a, at a time when the rings are at their absolute best. And they may have formed when the icy planetesimal came too close to Saturn and got ripped up or an icy planetesimal hit one of the icy moons of Jupiter and formed a ring. I tend to form the latter of the two where a planetesimal hit a moon and shattered uh, both objects. I'll explain why here shortly. So yeah, Saturn also has lots of moons. These are some of the irregular satellites of Saturn because they don't have a spherical shape. And these are all captured uh, from elsewhere in the solar system. Prometheus and Pandora are shepherd moons. They help maintain the shape of the narrow F ring. And here we just see Helene and Epimetheus really fast. We'll just again mention these in passing, unfortunately. And then we have um, uh, Janus, Phoebe, and Hyperion, more irregular satellites captured from elsewhere in the solar system. But Enceladus and Mimas are regular satellites. These two moons and the ones we'll see following likely formed around Saturn when it you know, formed uh, 4.5, 4.6 billion years ago. So Mimas has a large crater named Herschel, while Enceladus has active geysers erupting from these features here called tiger stripes in Enceladus's southern hemisphere. This also has a subsurface ocean. But there's a recent study to suggest the uh, geysers really come from the ice and not the ocean. So that's a very recent result that's just been announced recently. <laughs> so here we also see uh, Dione, Tethys, Rhea, and Iapetus. Iapetus is the yin yang moon. One half is very bright, like Rhea, Dione, and Tethys, but the other side here, which you can briefly see or partly see, is very dark because it orbits in Saturn's outermost. Uh, ring that was just discovered in the 2000s by the Spitzer Space Telescope. And here we see uh, Saturn's largest moon and the second largest moon in the solar system, Titan. And you can see what makes Titan so special is it has a atmosphere, the only moon in the solar system with a dense atmosphere. In, in fact, it's four times denser than Earth's atmosphere. So how could something so small 
just, you know, a wee bit bigger than the moon retain such a dense atmosphere? And the answer is it has just enough mass, but mainly it's really cold out there. So the surface temperature is about 290 degrees minus 290 degrees Fahrenheit. So the molecules in the atmosphere can't travel fast enough to escape Titan. So that's how this uh, you know, moon is able to retain such a dense atmosphere. And like Earth, this atmosphere is mostly nitrogen. So many people consider Titan uh, Earth, but in a deep freeze. But it gets even better is on the surface, we have uh, lakes and seas, not of water, but of methane and ethane. So yeah, Titan has many seas and lakes of methane, ethane, which is very exciting. And these were mapped out uh, through special filters with the Cassini uh, spacecraft and with radar mapping with Cassini. So the Cassini spacecraft had a little hitchhiker called the Huygens probe. So the Huygens probe launched from Cassini on December 25th, 2004, and actually landed on Titan's surface on January 14th, 2005. And this is what it saw. So here it is parachuting down through the atmosphere. It saw a uh, dried up sea, unfortunately, with uh, rivers and tributaries. And then plop, it landed on the surface. So this is the actual surface of Titan as seen by the Huygens probe. And these are not rocks, but they're fist-sized pebbles of water ice, which at these low temperatures are as hard as rocks. And you can see they're, they're round. So they've been smoothed out by this now dried up lake. So Titan is a pretty amazing place. Now we move on to Uranus named for the primal Greek god symbolizing the sky. And Uranus was the first planet to actually be discovered because we've known about the other planets, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn since ancient times. So Uranus was discovered on March 13, 1781 by William Herschel. Uranus is only a third Jupiter's diameter and a 20th the mass. And Uranus is the planet most famous for being knocked on the side. Uranus is inclined on its axis by 98 degrees. So it kind of rolls around in its orbit around the sun. So the entire system, rings and moons and all, have been tipped on their side. So we've only sent one probe to Uranus. That's Voyager 2 back in 1986. And it only got a good look at the moon Miranda. I won't show any close-up pictures here today, but Miranda has one of the tallest cliffs in the solar system. And you might notice that the names of the moons were chosen from characters and works by Shakespeare and Alexander Pope. So there's a strong need to go back to Uranus, but hopefully the new uh, James Webb Space Telescope will give us much closer looks than what we've had even with, say, the Keck telescopes. So our last stop on our major planet tour is Neptune, discovered by Johann Gott Gottfried Gale on September 23rd, 1846, but using calculations from Urban Leverrier. So it was actually Urban Leverrier who discovered Neptune on paper with calculations long before anybody ever saw it through a telescope. And Neptune completed its first orbit since it was discovered on July 12th, 2011. So Neptune is a little bit smaller than Uranus in diameter, but it's a couple more Earth's massive. So it's a little over 17 times the mass of Earth. And Uranus and Neptune are again ice giants, but some do call them the methane giants because they have a little bit of methane in their atmospheres that gives them their blue color. Now, Neptune does have 14 moons, but the moon of Neptune is Triton. I say this because Triton accounts for more than 99.5% the mass orbiting Neptune. So yes, all the other moons are only half a percent the mass of Triton. So there's something special about Triton. One clue 
is that it has a retrograde orbit. It is the only major moon that orbits its planet backwards, you know, clockwise. So this tells us that Triton was captured from elsewhere in the solar system, from a region that we'll see here very shortly called the Kuiper Belt. And Triton is just a little bit bigger than Pluto, but I personally find Triton a lot more fascinating. It has very few craters. It has what's called a cantaloupe terrain, and you can see many little dark streaks. Those are caused by nitrogen geysers. So Triton is a really cool place that we, again, need to visit for a sustained study. But we haven't been there since 1989 with Voyager 2. So beyond Neptune and Triton, we have the Kuiper Belt. So, you know, just like the asteroid belt, is made of rocky debris from the formation of the terrestrial planets. The Kuiper belt is made of the bits of leftover debris from the formation of the gas giants, both Jovian and ice giant alike. So the Kuiper belt uh, starts just beyond Neptune. So this is where Triton came from. And it extends between 30 and 50 AU from the sun. But of course, the most famous resident of the Kuiper belt is none other than Pluto, everyone's former or favorite former planet. So Pluto is, you know, a very interesting object. It's just, it's just not a planet. I'm sorry. People need to get over it. It's only 65% the moon's diameter, and Earth is 450 times the mass. And you can see it's only like, you know, roughly 18% the mass of our moon. So it's just a tiny, tiny object that, you know, because it's mostly ice or um, ice and rock, it, it has managed to crush itself into a sphere. But, you know, so what? Uh, uh, it, it, it may be a protoplanet like Ceres. We do kind of consider it, you know, a dwarf planet, which I think is stupid. But it's not a planet. It's really a Kuiper Belt object, but let's just leave it at that. So this view, of course, is from New Horizons back in July of 2015, where it saw this impressive feature here that looks like a heart called Tomba Regio. This half, the western half, is called Sputnik Planitia, which was likely created by a large impact on Pluto uh, a little over 100 million years ago. So in this region, you have no craters, but the rest of Pluto is pretty old. So that's why I find Triton a lot more interesting. So yeah, Pluto has five moons, but I really uh, say that Pluto and Charon have four moons because the center of gravity between these two objects is like right here outside of Pluto. So really these four objects orbit Pluto and Charon. But of course, everyone says Pluto has five moons. And so we discovered Nix and Hydra in 2005. We discovered Kerberos in 2011 and Styx in 2012. And these were all discovered in our search for Plutonian rings. But it turned out Pluto doesn't have rings. We now know that for certain, thanks to the New Horizons flyby. And we did get a really good look at Charon here. So here's Pluto's largest moon, discovered back in 1978 by James Christie. It's one twelfth the mass of Pluto, which is pretty close. For comparison, Earth's moon, you know, Luna, is only 1.2% the mass of Earth, but Charon is a twelfth the mass of Pluto. That's why they orbit a common center of mass or a common center of gravity between the two objects. So after New Horizons left the Pluto-Charon system, it had one more target called Arakoth that it flew by on January 1st, 2019. So this is likely our uh, first look at your typical Kuiper Belt object. It's likely a contact binary, and it turns out it's pretty flat. So this is our view of our uh, Kuiper Belt with Pluto and Arakoth here. So in this little box here, we fit the entire Kuiper Belt and the entire solar system. But we zoom way out and far beyond the Kuiper Belt is the Oort cloud. So as you can see, the Oort cloud is not kind of a flat donut-like belt like the Kuiper Belt, but it's a sphere 
about 10,000 to 100,000 AU from the sun. 10,000 to 100,000 astronomical units. That's 1.58 light years. 100,000 AU is 1.5 light years. So if, of course, if you include the Oort cloud in the solar system, the solar system is really big. So the Oort cloud is the source for uh, long period comets, while short period comets come from the Kuiper belt. So you can see there's a large gap between the Kuiper belt and the Oort cloud. So between the Kuiper belt and the Oort cloud, we have a region called the scattered disk. And this is where we find, at least most of the time, Eris. So Eris is the planet that led to the demotion of Pluto back in 2006. It, it's not quite as big as Pluto in diameter, but it's 27% more massive than Pluto. But again, the Kuiper belt or the Oort cloud is where we have comets. So again, short period comets come from the Kuiper belt, like Halley's Comet, but long period comets with periods greater than 200 years come from the Oort cloud. So here is Comet McNaught, which was the great comet of 2007 that people got to enjoy from the Southern Hemisphere. At least in Michigan, I never got to see it because it was January of 2007 and um, it was very, very cloudy. So I never got to see it. But this was the last really bright comet that we had um, since you know the 1960s. We did have another pretty good comet in 2011, but we didn't get to see that one either, at least in the Northern Hemisphere. So most of the time, comets don't look like this. Most comets in the Kuiper Belt or the Oort Cloud never come near the sun, but some comets do get knocked out of the orbits and make plunges to the sun. Some do it only once, some do it over and over again. So when these comets that come into the inner solar system are far from the sun, say beyond the orbit of Neptune, they're very frozen and inactive. But when they come near the sun and its warmth, their ices begin to sublimate. They go directly from a solid to a gas. So the nucleus of the comet, or what we call the dirty snowball, begins to form kind of an extended atmosphere. The comet doesn't have enough gravity to hold on to an atmosphere, but the gas moves along with it. So as this coma, as we call it, with the nucleus moves near the sun, sunlight and solar wind push back on this material to form uh, the tails. So yes, comets have two tails. One tail is exactly a w points away from the sun, while the other is a bit curved. So here are the two tails of a comet. Now here's Comet Neowise. For many years, I've used Comet Hale-Bopp, the last really bright comet we had in the Northern Hemisphere, but I've decided to replace that with Comet Neowise that put on a pretty decent show in July of 2020. So every comet has these two basic tails, the long blue tail, that points directly away from the sun is the ion or gas tail. So it's basically um, uh, atomic nuclei and free electrons. And then we have the dust tail, which is basically, you know, little bits of silicate material that we call dust. So the dust tail is always broad and thin, and that can uh, uh, curve away from the sun like we saw with Comet McNaught back in 2011. And then again, we see the coma, which surrounds the nucleus, the actual dirty snowball. So the source of the ion and gas tail is the coma. And the source of the coma is the nucleus. And remember, it's the ion tail that points in the opposite direction of the sun, because this is just atomic nuclei and electrons. They're very susceptible to the solar wind and pressure from sunlight. But here is your typical view of a comet nucleus. We did get a nice look at Halley's Comet back in 1986. And since then, we've seen several more comet nuclei, including uh, 67P churyumov garishmenko that the Rosetta spacecraft actually got to orbit for over a year. So that was pretty impressive.
So yes, these are the icy citizens of the outer solar system. So that pretty much concludes our tour of the solar system. But real quick here, there are other solar systems out there. Uh, there are what we call extrasolar planets, planets that orbit stars other than the sun. And today, or at least as of yesterday, it may have been updated for today, there are 4,917 confirmed discoveries with 3,636 planetary systems, and 810 of those contain uh, multiple planets, you know, two or more planets. So there are still many planets awaiting discovery. This is that they all orbit other stars. Beyond the solar system, we have the stars. And you can see stars come in a variety of you know, colors, which means stars have a variety of temperatures, but a lot more. So in short, the absolute best way to learn about the basic properties of stars, like their temperature, luminosity, mass, diameter, is to study the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram that was created by uh, Enar Hertzsprung and Henry Nuss Norris Russell back in the uh, uh, early 1910s. So in short, the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram or the HR diagram is a graph that plots temperature on the x-axis or the horizontal axis and luminosity on the y-axis or the vertical axis. So the temperature can be given by its spectral type, OBAFGKM, which was mainly developed in its modern sense by someone named Annie Jump Cannon in the early 20th century. So O-type stars are the hottest, which are blue, and M-type stars are the coolest, which are red. And you can also give it in terms of Kelvin too, but you know most astronomers give it in terms of the spectral type because it's more easily to uh, reference that way. And then we have luminosity in solar units, or at least in ratio with the sun. So when you divide the sun's luminosity by itself, you get one. So the sun, as mentioned, has a temperature on the surface of 5,800 Kelvin. So the sun is a G-type star, specifically G2, because each of these types very uh, has a subcategory from zero to nine. So the sun is a G2-type star which has a luminosity and ratio with itself of one. So this is where we find the sun. So the most important part of the HR diagram is the main sequence, which runs, uh, which is a band that runs from the lower right to the upper left. And this is where stars spend 90% of their lifetime fusing hydrogen into helium in their core. So this is what stars do for 90% of their life. And you'll see, you know, again, the hottest main sequence stars are on the left and the coolest main sequence stars are on the right. While the most luminous stars are on the top and the least luminous stars are on the bottom. So here we have very luminous O and B type main sequence stars. They're very hot and very bright, very luminous. While the red dwarfs down here they're very cool and they're very dim because they have small surface areas. Because two factors determine your luminosity and that's surface area and temperature. But surface area is really the more important of the two. Because if you have a larger surface area, that means you have more area to illuminate or emit light. So there you go. So again, the main sequence is very important. And then we have, uh, giant stars. These are medium mass main sequence stars that have moved off the main sequence and they're working toward the end of their life. So some giant stars can, you know, go out to, uh, say, the orbit of Earth. One day the sun will expand into a giant and will very likely engulf the Earth one day. But the most massive main sequence stars will become super giants toward the end of their life. And you'll notice we have diameter running uh, from the small stars here at the lower left to giant stars at the upper right. So, of course, we have the supergiants toward the upper right. 
they are very large. And I should mention the stars here are not shown to scale because super giants are even far larger than giant stars. If you plot Betelgeuse here in the solar system, its orbit would extend to Jupiter. So it's they're, they're very, very large. Now, super giants will basically go supernova, at least most of them should, and they'll form either neutron stars or black holes that we'll take a look at here shortly. But giant stars will eventually um, form white dwarfs. White dwarfs are basically the collapsed cores of giant stars. But again, more about them here shortly. So roughly half the stars in the sky are part of uh, binary or multiple star systems. Most stars you know, are not solitary like the sun, although that view may have changed a little bit over the years, but you know, many, many stars we see in the sky are either binary or triplet or quadruplet systems or, or more. So binary stars are very important because they help us determine the masses of stars. And they're a lot of fun to observe through telescopes too. So much, lar much larger groupings of stars bound by gravity are open clusters. Open clusters, also known as galactic clusters, which is probably a better name, uh, are found in the disks of spiral galaxies. So typically, open clusters are you know, relatively young, maybe millions to tens of millions of years old. Sometimes they can be billions of years old, but that's pretty rare. And here we have, for example, uh, the cluster M35, which is about 2,800 light years away, and a much denser, more distant cluster called NGC 2158, which is 11,000 light years away. So the sun was likely once part of a cluster like this. But again, these cl clusters don't last forever because they lose their members with encounters from alien stars, you know, stars outside the cluster. And typically, open clusters contain maybe tens to thousands of stars, you know, several thousand. But there are larger groupings of stars out there. And those are globular clusters, or more appropriately, globular clusters, because they're globe-shaped, which means they're spherical. So yes, these are spherical collections of stars that number at minimum in the tens of thousands. But some globular clusters, like this one here called Omega Centauri, can have over a million members. I believe Omega Centauri has an estimated 10 million members. It's probably the uh, nucleus of an extinct galaxy that the Milky Way captured. So Omega Centauri is only 86 light years across. So yes, we have a 86 light year diameter collection of stars. So the stars are pretty close together. You know, they're really packed together. And globular clusters are uh, characterized by much older stars. Again, open clusters can be maybe millions or hundreds of millions of years old on average. Globular clusters are at minimum eight to nine billion years old. So they are far older. Open clusters have metal rich stars, which means they contain elements beyond hydrogen and helium, while stars and globular clusters are really nothing but hydrogen and helium, with just a tiny, tiny amount of metals compared to stars in open clusters. So again, we find open clusters in the disks of spiral galaxies like the Milky Way while globular clusters are found in what we call the inner halo or the galactic halo. And, you know, open clusters orbit within the disk and they stay in the disk in large circular orbits, but globular clusters have vast elliptical orbits that can take, you know, over 500 million years to complete one circuit for the most distant globular clusters. So here we see another diagram of the Milky Way. So we see the central bulge, which you can see in the summertime, at least low on the south at my latitude. And you can, of course, see the disk. Even in the winter, you can see the disk of the Milky Way. But in the winter, we see the outer disk. In the summer, we, we're looking toward the center of the galaxy. And then again, the halos, where you mainly find the globular clusters. But you can also find fainter stars like red dwarfs and white dwarfs. But they're very faint because they're so far away. 
So we see our galaxy is again about 100,000 light years across and contains between 200 and 400 billion stars. And here are just some of those stars in the Milky Way that make up the famous constellation of Orion. Orion has three stars in a row, two above and two below. A nice little limerick you can uh, use to remember the shape of Orion if you need that because Orion is probably the most recognizable of all the constellations in the sky. But very special in the constellation of Orion is his sword and in the sword is where we find the great nebula in Orion or M42 for this half and M43 for the upper half but there are they're all part of the same complex so this is known as an emission nebula or an h2 region because it's composed of molecular hydrogen but you can also call this a stellar nursery because it's these types of nebulae where stars are actively in the process of forming so with the orion nebula shown here its mass is estimated to contain enough material to create 10,000 sun-like stars, but it won't probably produce that many. So there is an extremely young cluster, maybe 300,000 to a million years old, of about 300 stars emerging from the Orion Nebula right now. You can see that more clearly in the infrared view of the Orion Nebula, but I don't have that here uh, to share today. So we'll move toward the center of the Orion Nebula here in an area called the Huygens region. So the Huygens region is kind of a bright, sharply defined central cavity that's been carved out by uh, Theta Orionis, which is a multiple star system. And all these stars here are type O, especially Theta 1c Orionis here, which is a very uh, large star. This star here is 45 times the mass of the sun. And it's these young stars that give off a lot of ultraviolet light that cause the entire Orion Nebula, or at least the M42 part, to glow. So they excite the gases with their ultraviolet light and cause this entire nebula to emit light. So emission nebulae do give off their own light from nearby young hot stars like, like these, like the trapezium stars. Now, the Triffid Nebula is mainly an emission nebula, but this is a famous example where you see all three types of nebulae, at least regarding star formation, together. So again, we have a big pink emission nebulae. We have a blue reflection nebulae. This is where you have dust that scatters blue light from stars. That's, what, that's why they look blue. And then we have a dark nebula which is basically just a dark cloud of dust and gas that you can only see when it's in front of an emission nebula or a bright star field sh um, um, shown here. And in this case, of course, it's a bright emission nebula that reveals the dark nebula here. So the Triffid Nebula is about 4,100 light years away. And this also contains a cluster that's about 400,000 years old. But emission nebulae, is where stars are in the process of forming and where you find very young stars. Here is a dead star. This is known as a planetary nebula, nebula because through uh, small telescopes at low power, they look like planets. Otherwise, planetary nebulae really have nothing to do with planets. So this is a deep image of the famous ring nebula, M57, in the constellation Lyra. You can see this part through a telescope. You can really see the shape, but you can't see the color, unfortunately, unless you use time exposures, as uh, shown in this image from the Hubble Space Telescope here. And so, you know, this is the main part of the nebula. And here you see the actual white dwarf. This is the collapsed core of this once former star, but is, it is now long dead. And you can see these outer layers of the ring nebula that you really can't see through a telescope. And I'll show you where these come from. But first, let me tell you real quick that uh, the ring nebula is about 0.9 light years in diameter, while the outer halo is about two and a half light years across. 
and the entire thing's about 2,300 light years away. So now let me show you where the outer envelope comes from. Now remember, medium mass stars like the sun and a bit bigger will one day expand into a red giant. And long story short, because this would take a while to go through, as these stars expand and collapse, expand and collapse, they shut off their outer layers. So those are the outer parts of the ring nebula that we saw earlier. Those are the outer layers of the star that were ejected during these puls pulsations of the red giant. And again, we see the white dwarf at the center, which is the collapsed core of these medium mass stars. But some stars die much more violently. Planetary nebulae are again from medium mass stars that form over you know, maybe millions or tens of millions of years. Supernova remnants, you know, they take a long time to expand, but they form very quickly. So here is a supernova remnant known as the Crab Nebula, right near the southern horn of Taurus the Bull. Chinese astronomers saw this star explode in the year, um, oh shoot. <laughs> Uh, July 4th, 1054. I almost thought I forgot there for a minute. H had a uh, momentary uh, brain lapse there. So this is clearly not a planetary nebula. This is clearly a star that blew itself up. I mean, it just looks like something that blew up. And sure enough, it did. So the Crab Nebula is about 10 light years in diameter and expanding. And... Um, it contains about five uh, solar masses in all. The progenitor star, before it blew up, was probably between eight and 13 solar masses. So again, the most massive stars, eight times the mass of the sun or more, will explode as supernova. So again, this, this is sped up a bit, of course, but the, the shell expands relatively... It, under short time periods, you know, compared to a planetary nebula. Those take millions of years to really form, while supernova remnants can form in really just hundreds of years. And at the center, at least in this case, we don't have a white dwarf, but we have a neutron star. So their collapse cores of these stars don't form white dwarfs, they form neutron stars. They're not composed of just neutrons, uh, but, you know, we call them neutron stars because they're so compressed, the protons and electrons get squeezed together to form neutrons, but they contain other elements too. So neutron, uh, white dwarves are about the size of Earth. Neutron stars are about the size of a city. They have a radius of about 10 kilometers and a density of like 100 trillion grams per cubic centimeter. Uh, a sugar cube lump uh, of material from a neutron star would weigh 100 million tons. And they also have very powerful magnetic fields. The magnetic field would be a trillion times stronger than what you see from the sun. So here we see a uh, movie of the Crab Pulsar. And I'm not sure you can hear the sound, but that is an actual radio telescope data of the Crab Pulsar. The Crab Pulsar spins once around in 33 milliseconds. So if, if the core of the star is massive enough, it'll collapse into what we call a black hole. It'll become so small that it's density basically becomes infinite and nothing, not even light, can escape from a black hole. So here we see a black hole swallow or devour a star and form an X-ray jet. <laughs> so now we'll move on to the galaxies. And again, the best way to learn about galaxies is to study the uh, basic Hubble's galaxy classification scheme, also known as the Hubble tuning fork for obvious re reasons. And first on the tuning fork, we have the elliptical galaxies. 
So of course, E stands for elliptical, but the number comes from the shape of the galaxy. If your diameter and your height are equal, you know, A is equal to B, then that equals zero. So you're a very spherical galaxy. But most ellipticals are, you know, elliptical. So the larger the number, the more elliptical you get. And it's based on this little equation here. This is the only math I will show you today. <laughs> so here's a very famous elliptical galaxy. And most elliptical galaxies are very small, called dwarf elliptical galaxies. But this is a super giant elliptical galaxy called M87, also known by its radio name, Virgo A. And this is big. Um, M87 here is about 54 million light years away, and it's about 120,000 light years across, at least for the bright part. The outer extended part, which you can kind of see in the image here, makes the entire galaxy 490,000 light years in its extended diameter. And because it's, it's, it's uh, spherical and not flat like a spiral galaxy, it contains at least 2.7 trillion stars. Our galaxy has, again, maybe 200 to 400 billion stars. This one, again, has 2.7 trillion stars. And our galaxy has like maybe 150 globular clusters. This one has 12,000 globular clusters. The supermassive black hole at the heart of our galaxy is about 4 million times the mass of the sun. This one has a supermassive black hole 3.5 billion times the mass of the sun. And escaping from that black hole, or at least near the black hole, I should say, is a jet of matter, namely gas. And thanks to the Event Horizon Telescope, a array of radio telescopes around the world, we now have an image of the event horizon, or at least the shadow of the event horizon, of the black hole in, in, in M87. So you could say, you know, this is a direct image of the event horizon around the black hole, in M87. Pretty cool. So this is what the center of that galaxy might look like. As you see the event horizon there, and you see a disk around it with a jet escaping just outside the event horizon because it can't escape in from inside the event horizon. So these jets form from just outside the event horizon because these disks uh, around the black hole produce you know, magnetic fields and the material gets shot out along the north and south magnetic poles. So this is what we call an active galaxy because material is actively falling in and feeding the black hole. So next on our galactic tour is kind of a segue between ellipticals and spirals called a SO or a lenticular galaxy. So lenticular galaxies are like spiral galaxies. They have a central bulge and a disk, but no spiral arms in the disk. But like elliptical galaxies or globular clusters, um, they contain very old stars. So you don't really see much in the way of uh, star formation in lenticular galaxies. You can see a little bit of dust here where there might be some star formation, but typically you, you don't have a lot of star formation in these types of galaxies. In elliptical galaxies, you have no star formation. But now we move on to the more regular spiral galaxies. And so if you're an SA galaxy like this one, then you have tightly wound spiral arms. So here is uh, Bode's galaxy, or M81, in the constellation Ur Ursa Major, not too far from the bear's ear. This galaxy is about 12 million light years away, 90,000 light years across, and contains a 70 million solar mass black hole, much larger than the one we find in our galaxy, even though our galaxy is bigger than this galaxy. So this particular galaxy, is also known as a grand design galaxy because it has two symmetrical spiral arms. It doesn't have any obvious branches or spurs, maybe a little spur here, but otherwise it's a very symmetrical galaxy. 
But here we have an SC galaxy, which has very open and loose arms. So in the middle, you'll have an SB galaxy that has kind of uh, intermediate arms of, you know, not too tight, not too loose like this galaxy. So here we see the fireworks galaxy, NGC 6946. Again, this is an SC spiral galaxy. That's about 22 and a half million light years away, about 75,000 light years across. And it's known as the fireworks galaxy because it's had nine supernovae in the past 60 years. On average, you get one supernova in a galaxy per century. But this one's had nine of them in the last 60 years. So you can see why we call it the fire fireworks galaxy. And then below, we have uh, the barred spiral galaxies. So from the central bulge, there's a bar of you know, stars and gas and dust that extend outward. And from the ends of the bar, you have spiral arms. So if you're an SBA galaxy, like this one, you have uh, very tightly wound arms at the end of a bar. So here we see this beautiful barred spiral galaxy, quite literally your textbook barred spiral because I think I've seen this galaxy in every astronomy textbook I've ever seen. So this particular barred spiral galaxy is NGC 1300. That's about 61 million light years away and 110,000 light years in diameter. So very comparable to our galaxy. And speaking of our galaxy, this is another artistic view of the Milky Way. This is not a real image, of course, but our galaxy is a type SBC spiral galaxy. So again, we're here. So we view the bar at a, bit, at, at a bit of an angle. But based on how our bar is more elliptical and not round, and based on infrared and radio telescope data, we've been able to determine that we do live in, fa uh, live in fact in a barred spiral galaxy. But about two thirds of all spirals are barred spirals like this one. So that's not too unusual. Now, like stars, most galaxies are not isolated. Most galaxies are found in clusters of galaxies. The Milky Way is part of a poor galaxy cluster called the local group of galaxies. It's a poor galaxy cluster because it doesn't contain a lot of galaxies. This one contains about 55 known galaxies, again, including the Milky Way and the uh, very famous Andromeda galaxy. And of the bright galaxies in the local group, 14 are dwarf ellipticals. So this is why we consider dwarf ellipticals the most common type of galaxy in the universe, because even the nearby, most of the nearby ones are dwarf ellipticals. And even the ones that are nearby are very faint and difficult to see. So if they're far away, they're really hard to observe. And then there are three spirals or four, if you want to include the large Magellanic cloud, because it is trying to form a spiral shape. So you can say three or four spiral galaxies. And then there are four irregular galaxies, again, of the bright galaxies. So there's one spiral I haven't mentioned yet, and that is M33, the Triangulum Galaxy, because we find it in the constellation Triangulum. So this galaxy is between 2.4 and about 3.1 million light years away. It's about 60,000 light years in diameter and it contains about 40 billion stars. So about 10% as many stars as our galaxy. But much more grand is the Andromeda galaxy, M31. The bright portion of the galaxy from roughly maybe here to here is about 130,000 light years across. But again, you can see fainter outer parts. And this means the entire galaxy is 220,000 light years across. It contains approximately 1 trillion stars compared to the Milky Way's 200 to 400 billion again. It's about 1.5 trillion times the mass of the sun versus 850 billion times the mass of the sun for the Milky Way. And Andromeda contains a 100 million solar mass black hole. So it is kind of odd that the Milky Way 
contains a relatively low mass black hole considering its size. Because we see much bigger black holes in similar type galaxies. So I mentioned the Andromeda galaxy, the Triangulum galaxy, and the Milky Way galaxy are part of the local group. And here we see the sun 28,000 light years from the center of the Milky Way galaxy in the Orion Cygnus spiral arm. But here we go. Here we see the large and small Magellanic clouds. We see some members of the local group. There's the Andromeda galaxy and M33. So now we see the entire local group of galaxies. Now we see the M81 group. The M81 group that contains the galaxy M81 is the nearest galaxy group to the local group. It contains about 34 galaxies. So it's another poor galaxy cluster. And now we see a rich galaxy cluster that could be the Virgo cluster. The Virgo cluster is about 54 million light years away. M87 is at the center of the Virgo cluster. And this galaxy cluster contains approximately 2,000 members. So that's why we call it a rich galaxy cluster. Now we're really going to zoom out here. And the local group and the Virgo cluster are part of what's called the Laniakea supercluster of galaxies. The Laniakea supercluster contains between 300 to 500 galaxy clusters in a region 160 megaparsecs in diameter. And the Laniakea supercluster is part of the Pisces Cetus supercluster complex. That is the galaxy filament, like say this here or here, that we live in. So we have clusters, superclusters, all grouped into, you know, long filaments and walls of galaxy clusters. So this is what we call the large scale structure of the universe or the cosmic web. So finally, at our conclusion here today, I'm finally going to show you your place among the infinities. So you can add, you know, your name here at the top. And you are located currently at some address in a certain city, state, or province in some country somewhere around the world, because we have people from multiple countries joining us here today. And of course, most of us are on some continent, but many of us are on an island, say the U United Kingdom, for example. And you are either in the Eastern or Western Hemisphere. I do believe we have people here from both. So I include both hemispheres here. But we are all on the Earth, which is in the solar system, which we find in the Orion Cygnus spiral arm, which is part of the Milky Way galaxy, which is part of the local group of galaxies. Now, we used to think the local group of galaxies was part of the Virgo supercluster, but now we've come to realize the Virgo supercluster is just a lobe in the Laniakea supercluster of galaxies. And just FYI, this is my name here. No one else uses this, so that, that's just me. So yes, we are part of the Laniakea supercluster of galaxies, which is part of the Pisces Cetus supercluster complex. That is the galaxy filament, say like, this one that we are a part of. And the Pisces Cetus supercluster com complex is part of the universe. So this is your place among the infinities.